all shall heal. Darth 3PO! And now we come to the final novel in the Thrawn trilogy. Really, The Last Command has to have the worst cover yet. Both Han and Leia are stock, and the rest are drawn in such a way that they resemble action figures rather than people. Although I will admit that the inclusion of Mera on the cover was a good move, as this would really be the first time that we'd ever see what she actually looked like. And also, I think it's important to note that the cover is actually misleading, as that is not actually Luke that she is fighting but rather his clone. Even with that, the cover is still poorly drawn on all accounts. And really, it just looks cheap. The novel begins by showcasing one of Thrawn's new tactics. He uses the cloaking device that he got from the Mount Tantus facility to fool the inhabitants of Yukian into believing that he has the ability to fire through planetary energy shields. What Thrawn does is he puts cloaking devices on a number of crack-class cruisers and freighters. He then uses a combination of Sabaoth's battle meditation and timing to make it seem that his Star Destroyers are firing through the planetary energy shields. Thrawn was of course able to figure out that the Yukians would be susceptible to this tactic because he studied their art, and he was able to discern that they would be unable to accept the impossible. During the battle, Saboeth is able to sense that Leia is close by, so he breaks off an entire task force to try and capture her. They of course fail. But in addition to that, prior to the battle, Saboeth was able to use the force power of Dominate Mind to command Captain Peleon to create a special clone for him by using a particular skin sample. After Saboeth gives Peleon this command, he uses a mind rub technique to make him forget he ever received the command in the first place. Now, Saboeth will become more and more rogue as the story goes on, but Thrawn still thinks he can control him. This would prove to be his second mistake. Thrawn is also preparing another kidnapping attempt on Leia, this time using standard commandos rather than Nogri. Leaving our antagonists for a moment, we find that Luke is trying to find a transshipment point for all of the clones that are being shipped out to the various theaters of war. While trying to find the clones, he meets up with Talon Kurade. Now this is actually the beginning of Karade's involvement in the New Republic war effort. Luke searches in vain, as he's unable to find the transshipment point. But it gets worse for Luke, as he's found out as a New Republic agent, and he is chased from the planet. During his flight, he is accosted by the Chimera yet again. And it should come to everyone's complete lack of surprise that he is able to escape. Unlike in Heir to the Empire, Thrawn does not kill the tractor operator. Instead, he commends him for using a special tactic to try and capture Luke, thus proving that Thrawn is not your average villain. And I guess we can just chalk up that first kill to Thrawn's nervousness at the beginning of the campaign. Even though Luke was able to escape, he still ends up facing the same problem that he did the first time. But unlike that time, he still has FTL capability. And due to both plot convenience and the Force, he just so happens to be in range of... the Nogri homeworld. Moving on to Leia's side of the story, we find that she's on the capital world of Coruscant, and she's attempting to devise a plan to stop the Empire from reconquering all of their lost territory, when she is interrupted by another issue that's a bit more personal. She finally has her two kids. Yes, Zahn actually includes the birth of Jason, whose name is for some reason spelled with a C instead of an S, and Jania whose name is also somewhat odd. Jason will go up to become a Sith Lord in a rehash of the original trilogy called The Legacy of the Force, and Janya will become a fairly decent character in her own right as sort of an amalgamation of Leia and Mara Jade. Zahn, with his ability to keep the plot moving, does not dwell on the twins too long, and quickly gets back to the action with 
the New Republic engages the Empire in an unnamed region of space. Thrawn's new tactic is to use interdictor cruisers to pull Imperial capital ships out at precise points, thus allowing him to use his reinforcements more effectively. It is at this point in the story that a new political entity begins to form, and that is the Smuggler's Alliance. It begins when Karade strikes a deal with another smuggler named Samuel Gillespie. Samuel Gillespie? Why in a continuity with names like Garmbel Ilblis? And Arvel Carvid, do we have a name like Samuel Gillespie? What is he from Earth? How do you get a name like that in a galaxy like Star Wars? Seriously, how do you go from hard to pronounce names with Y's and V's everywhere to Samuel Gillespie? What's next? Somebody named Hank Smith? Anyway, before they can continue their deal, they are interrupted by a number of Imperials. However, they set a date for both them and other smugglers to meet again. This meeting would essentially become the very first smugglers conference. Joining Thrawn once again, we find that he needs raw materials to continue his assault, which Lando conveniently has. Rejoining Luke on the Nogri homeworld, we find that he is being hidden in a small pocket of inhabitable land. It is here that he decides to try and see into the future to make certain that Leia is going to be alright. And that's really the main problem with the Force. Whenever you need a new power, you can just make one up. Like flow walking. The power that lets you walk backwards through time. But in this case, Luke already had this power. Foresight is the power that lets you see into the future. And it's a power that you would think Luke would use more often, but he really doesn't for some reason. I know in Back to the Future, Doc Brown said you really shouldn't know too much about your own future, but in Luke's case, this is kind of important, because if he had used it, he might have been able to predict, oh, I don't know, the Yuzhan Vong War, or perhaps the Second Galactic Civil, or perhaps... Luke learns that Leia is going to be in some kind of danger. This, of course, is dramatic irony, since we already know that Imperial Commanders are going to attempt to abduct her. Even though, I would have to imagine that his visions would have to be at least a little more accurate, to the point that he would at least have some idea who the attackers were going to be. Luke can't leave the Nogri homeworld due to an Imperial ship putting in for repairs. So we're going to leave him for a moment and return to Lando. And, big surprise here, his nomad city has since been critically damaged by the Imperials. It always seems that Lando's ventures are destroyed by whatever belligerent power is active in the galaxy at the time. Cloud City and Nomad City were destroyed by the Empire, and later in the New Jedi Order series, his mining station was one of the first places to be destroyed by the invading Yuzhan Vong. I'd have to say, it's probably hard to find investors at this point. I'm sorry, Mr. Calrissian, but your investment profile does not paint a pretty picture. Most of your major investments have either been destroyed or invaded, and some of your smaller ventures have simply failed. So I am going to have to turn down the opportunity to invest in this... Vonganator. I hope you have better luck elsewhere. Returning to Coruscant, we finally learn just why Mera has such a psychotic hatred for Luke. You see, apparently, every night she has a dream where both Luke and Vader turn on the Emperor and kill him. Now, that is vastly, vastly different than from what really happened. In fact, it's a bit more exciting, I would have to say. So, you're just going to throw your lightsaber on the ground and stand there and stare at him. You're not going to kill the leader of the evil genocidal empire. You failed your you're just going to stand there like an idiot. Like my father before. Oh, and big surprise, he's killing you now. You know, maybe instead of just standing there, you could have... Oh, I don't know. Kill him! Anyway, Leia visits Mera in her quarters. And even Leia, with her limited Jedi senses, knows that she doesn't want to kill him. So you would imagine that Mera would drop the whole killing Luke thing. But of course, she mentions it several more times in the novel. After Leia's fairly pointless conversation, Mera picks up a disturbance in the Force. Which just means that she knows something is about to happen. It turns out that the Imperial Commandos have arrived. 
And this is where Zahn does something rather interesting. You see, when Mara steps out of her quarters to confront the commandos, she is immediately stopped by an unknown agent. Only to cut to Lando and Garmbel Iblis several minutes earlier when they discover that something is amiss. We follow them all the way up until they confront Mara Jade. And it turns out that Garm was the unknown agent. Now this is a really interesting literary device. You have events occur from one character's perspective and have the same events occur from yet another character's perspective. Really, it does skew your perception of reality and leaves you pausing in askance as to what you just read. Really, when this happens, you never really know what's going on. You don't know who's going to be the actual unknown agent. And in the end, it just works rather well. Mara, Lando, and Garm, and a number of Rent-A-Cops, engage the Commandos. They manage to capture the Commandos' leader, and he is under orders to implicate Mara as the one who let them into the building. With that bit of information, she is arrested. Regarding the war effort, the main problem is the clones. You see, Thrawn has what amounts to a bottomless well of manpower. So in order to truly take Thrawn down, one needs to first take out the main cloning facility. Now Mara Jade knows where the cloning facility is, and she eventually decides to side with the New Republic. Their plan of attack is to send a strike team consisting of Luke, Mara, Lando, Han, and Chewie. Really, that's almost exactly out of Episode 6. But I just hope there's no Ewoks this time. Thrawn is preparing to attack Coruscant, but one of the things he says during the preparations is somewhat odd. Now, this is a comment to Peleon. He says, history is on the move. Those who cannot keep up will be left behind to watch from a distance, and those who stand in our way will not watch at all. Now that's a fairly good line. The only problem is, it's a bit excessive for a comment to your second-in-command. Now, if that was a speech, or anything like that, yeah, that'd probably work. But you have to really imagine he must have practiced that for some time prior to delivering it. I mean, really, the only time you need practice like that is for a major speech to the Imperial populace, or the moon landing, or something like that. You know. Um, and he was probably practicing in his head as he came down the ladder going, one small step for man, giant leap for mankind. One small step for man, giant leap for mankind. Okay, Neil, don't fuck it up now. Don't fuck it up. Here we go. I'm a small man with a giant leaping... Oh, shit. The Wayland strike team proved to have fairly good timing as they depart Coruscant just before the Imperials attack. of the battle, the New Republic commander proves to be a less than capable tactician. Now, Garm is on Coruscant, but he is refusing to both do his job and lend assistance. And this is because of a fairly petty matter. He wants the Chief of State Mon Mothma to personally accept him as a commander. Now, Leia is attempting to get the reluctant Garm to actually, you know, do his job. And she, like everyone else, is taken aback by this thoroughly idiotic statement. Lucky for the New Republic and thousands of militiamen, Mon Mothma shows up just at the right time to convince Garm to actually do his job. Talk about an engraved invitation. The attack itself was merely a cover. Thrawn's plan this time is to blockade Coruscant with invisible asteroids, which is a good way to get around the inherent issue of not being able to see out when you're using the cloaking device. In addition to the cloaked asteroids, Thrawn also dry fires the tractor projectors to make it seem that he deployed more asteroids than he actually did. Since the asteroids are in orbit around Coruscant, the New Republic has to keep the planetary energy shields up so that the asteroids do not re-enter the atmosphere and destroy a large portion of the planet. This means that Coruscant is effectively blockaded. Meanwhile, on the other side of the galaxy, our strike team has landed on Wayland. 
The first problem that they encounter are animals that are drawn to repulsor lift vehicles. Since this is the future, or past, or whatever the case may be, they only thought to bring speeder bikes. And see, this is why the Warthog LRV is such a good vehicle. True is basic, but at least it works. In addition, the entire trek through the jungle is straight out of episode 6, right down to getting help from the natives. However, in this case, the natives are much cooler than those stupid Ewoks. In this case, the natives don't really want to help them, but they won't stop them either. Let's just say the enemy of my enemy is a problem for later. Also, during the trek through the jungle, our team encounter a number of Nogri who willingly help them in their endeavor. You see, this is how you know you're moving up in the galaxy. Whenever you go on your highly sensitive, highly covert deep penetration mission, you have troops in addition to your standard troops. Or, to put another way, your help has help of their own. Now, throughout the entire trilogy, Thrawn has been getting information from inside the New Republic, and until this point, no one really knew how he was doing it. All they really had was a name, Delta Source. While well, Leia had taken it upon herself to organize a small team independent of the New Republic to track Delta Source down, it turns out that Delta Source was a highly sophisticated recording device that were essentially trees that were planted inside of what was called the Grand Concourse. Now this was part of the main governmental building, meaning that this was a prime location to pick up all sorts of highly sensitive data. See the problem with going green? You never know when your trees are going to turn on you. Hang your faded trees on the hanging tree. Since the New Republic needs to end the blockade around Coruscant, and also needs a victory in the face of Thrawn's campaign, the New Republic decides to eliminate two targets with one last bolt. They decide to attack the Imperial shipyards at Bilbringi. Now this is done for two reasons. One, they want to capture a crystal graph field trap. They need that device so that they can detect the cloaked asteroids in orbit around Coruscant. And another reason is, they want to destroy most of the shipyard to severely diminish the Imperials' shipbuilding capacity. Now the New Republic knows that it can't simply attack a major shipyard, so they decide to try and deceive Thrawn into believing that they are going to attack in a different and considerably less well defended location. The only problem is, is that when dealing with Thrawn, it's generally unwise to try and trick him, as he will almost always see through it. Which he, of course, does. And he sets about preparing a warm reception at Bilbringi. After a few days trekking through the jungle, Mera and the strike team arrive at the Mount Tantus installation. They hit another bit of good luck, as a large group of natives decides to attack the physical entrance to the mountain, thus providing an effective distraction. And thus begins the first stage of the Mount Tantus battle. The second battle begins when Luke and Mera attempt to find the self-destruct located in Palpatine's throne room. The only problem with that is that Seboeth was placed in that same room by Thrawn several hours earlier. Unfortunately, Thrawn underestimated Seboeth's power. He allowed Seboeth to return to Wayland, but he neglected to put any force lizards on his ship. And while en route to the planet, Seboeth used his highly effective Dominate Mind Power to basically rewrite the minds of all the people on the ship. But that's just the beginning. Seboeth has had bombs placed on all of the Force Lizards throughout the building. But that's not all either, as he also intends to take control of all of the clones in the Mount Tantus facility as well. It looks like Thrawn's second mistake was rather costly, to say the least. As should be expected, there is a duel. But Luke's opponent is not who you would expect it to be. Seboeth has created a clone of Luke, imaginatively named Luke. Once again, what if he didn't have a U in his name? What if it was Hani clone? What do they call him, Hantu? Luke 
does have some difficulty fighting his clone, but he does receive some assistance. Prior to Mara killing Luke, Talon Karade and Leia had arrived on Wayland. You see, Leia had received a Force vision that Luke would need help. Unfortunately, Leia proves to be pretty much useless. Although, her lightsaber proves to be a lifesaver as Mara uses it to kill Luke. Also, the entire Tantus duel is straight out of Episode 6, with Saboeth as the all-powerful Emperor and Luke as Vader. But the addition of Mara makes it all worthwhile. With the elimination of Luke's doppelganger, there is but one target left to terminate. Despite showing mastery over TK and Force Scream, Mara is able to kill Saboeth by plunging a lightsaber into his chest, whereupon, for some reason, he explodes. I guess the lightsaber she was using had the ultimate datum power cell in it. The New Republic fleet reaches Bill Bringy only to find that... It's a trap! bodyguard stabs him in the chest, thus killing him. No! And that was Thrawn's first and last mistake. It's never wise to keep a member of an enslaved species as your bodyguard. In addition to that, a group of smugglers that will later become known as the Smugglers Alliance capture a crystal grab field trap and, due to a bit of Johannesburg engineering on the part of Chewie and Lando, the Mount Tantus installation is destroyed. And the trilogy ends with Mara Jade becoming the liaison between the newly created Smugglers Alliance and the New Republic. In addition, Luke decides to give her Vader's old lightsaber as a parting gift. I don't even need to say it, because there is considerable evidence to that fact. The Thrawn Trilogy was an extremely influential series. It basically made Star Wars what it is today. Even that unnecessary prequel trilogy drew elements from that novel series. Coruscant is the best example. Now, Thrawn is a brilliant writer. He is very good with pacing. He never bogs down anywhere. And he easily could have, and in other novels it does. Also, he has a knack for introducing great characters. Let's first take a look at Thrawn. Thrawn is probably the most awe-inspiring Imperial ever, but he's not necessarily an Imperial. It can be said that he's not an Imperial per se, but rather he wants a strong, militarized galaxy. 
And in the pursuit of this goal, he is never that ruthless. That's not to say that he's good by any means, but that he's not evil like Vader and many of the other Imperial commanders. I suppose one could compare him to Erwin Rommel, Heinz Guderian, and other various military commanders, that while you don't support them, you still respect them for their skills and what they were able to do. Now, the commanders that I have listed were still bad, but they weren't necessarily evil. Overall, Thrawn was a commander that inspired loyalty rather than fear. With fear, you get a force that will follow you because they have to out of fear that you will harm them in some way. And usually, they will not fight to the best of their ability because they don't really have that much of a reason to fight. But with loyalty, you have a fighting force that actually has a reason to fight. And they're not fighting because they have to, but rather because they want to. <laughs> Thus is the fate of enemies of the Empire. Captain and later Admiral Paleon is a great supporting character in that he is an actual character and not just some yes man. He actually checks the wrong on a number of decisions. Now he's not usually right, but the fact that he even has an opinion is important. The character of Captain Paleon would grow as the expanded universe progressed, and he really did come into his own later in the series. Eventually, he actually transcended his Imperial roots and became commander of the Galactic Alliance fleet. The Galactic Alliance being the government that replaced the New Republic during the Yuuzhan Vong War. But that's another story for another video. In the end, Paleon came to be my favorite character in the series, so much so that I had his name forever immortalized on the back of my letter jacket. Told you. To this day, Mara Jade is one of the most popular characters in the series. And I think that is because she is sort of an amalgamation of Luke, Leia, and Han. And also, she is another character that has grown considerably. And she is a character that can show that some people can indeed change. And this is just my opinion, but I think her transition from Emperor's Hand to Jedi Master served as the inspiration for the Knights of the Old Republic and the redemption of Revan. Although, now that I think of it, in Revan's case, I guess it doesn't really count, as they really did just wipe his mind. Kraid would not be quite as popular as the rest, but he was still a fairly decent character in his own right. And he does show just what a more ruthless Han Solo would look like. As for the other various minor characters, a vast majority of them would see repeated mention in other works. Wedge and Rogue Squadron would eventually get their own multimedia franchise, with several games and an entire book series chronicling their adventures. Of it all, the Thrawn trilogy basically finished what Lucas started, and pretty much the entire expanded universe expands from these novels. Now as to the fact that there was no Thrawn movie trilogy, well, I have but one utteration. Oh God! Rogue Squadron, good the unifying force, or whatever makes you happy.